Okay, well, um, this evening I'm going to talk, as, as Betty said, about the ancient mysteries and modern Freemasonry. Uh, and in fact, I have a thesis. And the thesis of my talk is that modern Freemasonry and the ancient mysteries have some very significant uh, correspondences, some analogies, some things they share. Now, underlying that thesis is an assumption. Uh, assumptions are not the same thing as theses, right? A thesis is something you're supposed to prove. And so I'm going to try to prove my thesis to you this evening. My assumption I'm not going to try to prove. Uh, my assumption is something even stronger than the thesis. Namely, that modern Freemasonry and the ancient mysteries are both manifestations or expressions of the same underlying cause, which is uh, something which is inherent in human nature. Now, my talk this evening, then, uh, is going to be uh, directed towards four ends. First, we'll talk a little bit about what the ancient mysteries were, and then we'll talk a little bit about what modern Freemasonry is, and we will talk about the similarities between the two. That's my thesis, right? And then I am going to suggest to you perhaps what the causes of those similarities are. And that's my assumption. Now, we're not going to do that in that nice orderly fashion. Uh, since uh, in my, all of my years of teaching, uh, I developed a technique of teaching which was by indirection uh, and, and by wandering around. And so I, I'm not, I don't intend to spoil that this evening. All right, but first let's begin with what the ancient mysteries were. The ancient mysteries were an extraordinary phenomenon uh, in the Mediterranean world and in the Near East. Uh, they were initiatory societies, and there were a, quite a large number of them. Uh, you, uh, I, on the handout, if you have it, and there's some copies on the chair in the back if you don't, uh, I have listed some of the ancient mysteries. Uh, the first are the mysteries of Eleusis. And I list those first, and they're the ones I'm going to use as an example of what the ancient mysteries were for several reasons. One is they are probably the best known of the ancient mysteries. Uh, they were probably the most influential of them. And they probably lasted the longest of them. The mysteries of Eleusis were already very old when we first have uh, a mention of them. The Greek philosophers in the 5th century BC mention the Eleu Eleusinian mysteries and say they are very ancient at that time. And they continued to exist until about the 4th century AD when they were put out of business. So that's well over a thousand years they existed. Isn't that a long time for any institution to last? And one of the remarkable things about that is that during that thousand years uh, when the Eleusinian mysteries existed, um, they must have initiated tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people. Maybe millions, for all I know. They must have initiated a huge number of people. And do you know that to this day, we do not know exactly what went on in the mysteries of Eleusis. The initiates were pledged to secrecy, and they kept their pledges. So we have only rather indirect comments about what went on uh, in the Eleusinian mysteries. Well, in addition to them, of course, there were other mysteries. Uh, mysteries of Mithra, uh, a Persian fellow. Uh, mysteries of Isis, an Egyptian goddess. And then uh, mysteries of Bacchus uh, or, or Dionysus uh, and uh, mysteries of the Great Mother and just all, uh, many other kinds of, uh, of mysteries uh, existed in the ancient world. Now, what were some of the characteristics of all of those mysteries? Well, let me give you uh, just a few mentions, just a few of the things that most of the mysteries tended uh, to share. First of all, they were all forms of ritual initiation. Uh, they were a little bit, in that respect, like Phi Beta Kappa. Are any of you familiar with Phi Beta Kappa, College Honorary Society? Um, uh, Phi Beta Kappa exists for only one purpose. 
which is to initiate new members in Phi Beta Kappa. <laughs> that's all it does. <laughs> in a sense, that's all the mysteries did, was to initiate new members. But the initiation was significant. Um, Aristotle commented that the mysteries were not a matter of knowing something, not a matter of information. Initiates were not taught things in the mysteries. They were rather a matter of experiencing something, and that something which was experienced was the initiation, and of being changed or transformed by the experience. So the mysteries are non-cognitive. They've got no intellectual content. Rather, there is an experience, which is the experience of initiation. And that experience uh, was very powerful. Uh, it's also said that in the, uh, the ancient mysteries, something was told, something was shown, and something was done. And we can only guess what that means. But actually, I think we can guess pretty safely. What was told was a myth, because every one of the mysteries had associated with it a myth. So we take, for example, uh, the, the mysteries of Isis. Some of you may be familiar with the, uh, the myth of Isis, the great mother goddess, uh, whose husband, Osiris, was killed by Osiris's brother, who was a nasty sort of fellow and whose body got chopped up and scattered all over. And Isis had to travel all over to find parts of the dismembered Osiris and bring them back together so that that dismembered Osiris could be resurrected in a new form. Um, or the mystery uh, associated with the, the Persian god Mithra. Uh, here it's less clear because we don't have a good account of what Mithra did. But clearly, he had uh, he sacrificed a bull, and from that sacrifice of the bull created the world. And there's a whole myth involved with this. So all the mysteries had associated with them some myth. Uh, Inside the mysteries of Eleusis are unusual, in that all the other mysteries are named after God or a goddess, right? A, a divine being. But the mysteries of Eleusis are named after a place. Eleusis is a little town not far from Athens. Uh, most of the mysteries could be performed anywhere. Mysteries of Mithra can, uh, could and were performed all over, uh, the, uh, the, the, all over Europe. Uh, if any of you, have any of you ever been to, uh, to England, gone up to see Hadrian's Wall across the top of, of Britain? Well, if you pass through along Hadrian's Wall, you will come to a place where there are the foundations of a Mithraic temple. So the Roman garrison that kept the wall uh, practiced the Mithraic mysteries, and they built a temple for it, underground temple. Uh, but the mysteries of Eleusis could be practiced only in one place, and that was at Eleusis itself, because that's where they were associated with. The mysteries of Eleusis concern the goddess of grain and her daughter Persephone. And Persephone was carried off by the god of the underworld. And um, Demeter, her mother, had to rescue her from Hades, from the underworld. And all of the mysteries, the myths of all of the mysteries, are concerned with death and resurrection. And these are not, not just physical death and physical resurrection. But uh, uh, you and I die every moment of our lives. Every moment is a death in which, in which what we were ceases to be. And if we're fortunate, we have a resurrection in which something new comes into existence. And that's really what the mysteries are about, about dying and being reborn, not just once, but constantly. Okay, another characteristic of uh, the mysteries uh, is that uh, uh, they, were, they were secret. Now, why were the mysteries secret? 
Well, let me tell you, modern Freemasonry is still secret, right? Uh, do we have any, any, any Masons in the crowd? Few will admit, okay. You can't talk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, well, you can admit you're a Mason. That's not, that's not forbidden. But you can't tell what goes on inside a Masonic meeting, right? Uh, you have taken vows of secrecy that you will not reveal the secrets of Freemasonry. Well, let me tell you, non-Masons, that you can go to any decent-sized library in this country and find a book which will tell you all of the secrets of Masonry. <laughs> Someone has once said that the greatest secret of Masonry is that it has no secrets. <laughs> They've all been published, right? every blessed one of them. And not always completely accurately, but they have all been published. Well, then what's this business about taking powerful oaths never to reveal a secret which is already in print all over the place? I will suggest to you that the mysteries, the secrets of both the ancient mysteries and of modern Freemasonry have exactly the same function. It's not to keep some information secret. What did Aristotle say? The mysteries are not about learning something. They're not about information. Rather, the mysteries are about an experience. Now, how many of you have ever in your lives bitten into a, a slice of lemon? Everyone I should have, or, or something similar, right? Could you tell someone who had never tasted a lemon what it is like to bite into a slice of lemon? Could you describe that adequately in words? And I'll suggest you cannot. You can sort of talk around it. You can talk symbolically about it. And if you're talking to somebody who has had the same experience you had, you can communicate. Eh? But you're not communicating because what you have said with your words. You've communicated because you have tapped into something in that other person which revives an experience they had. Eh? All experiences are essentially incommunicable. Eh? Every experience is essentially entirely personal. The ancient mysteries, and indeed modern Freemasonry, are about an experience. And the experience is caused by the ceremony of initiation. And the fact is, I can't tell you about that, that initiation because I can't tell you anything really important about it. Because it's an experience. And unless you've had it, I can't describe it. I could tell you what happens, literally. But my vows of secrecy mean I can't even do that. But those vows of secrecy are themselves symbolic. The vow of secrecy in the mysteries and in Freemasonry are themselves symbols. They are symbols of the fact that the most important things in life cannot be put into words. Can you describe what love is? We'll get away from something as trivial as a slice of lemon. Can you describe what love is? Not just how you might feel, not just how you might behave, but what is love? Don't you think that love is a great mystery? Uh, do we have any Harry Potter fans uh, in, in the crowd? <laughs> if we do, you will remember, if you've read uh, at least through book five, that in um, the, uh, the Ministry of Magic, which is the great governing body in, in uh, the magical world, there is in the basement of that vast building something called the Department of Mysteries where they study the mysteries of life. And the mysteries of life include death, time, consciousness, free will. But there's one room in the Department of Mysteries which is locked. And nobody can get in it. And in that room they study, Professor Dumbledore tells Harry Potter at one point, they study the greatest mystery of all the mystery which nobody understands. And what is that mystery? Love. It's the one thing that Harry has 
throughout his whole being from a sacrifice his mother made for him. Uh, the really important things in life we cannot talk about. We can't put them into words. And so the promises of secrecy in the mysteries and in Freemasonry, I believe, are symbolic of the fact that what is really important cannot be described, cannot be talked about. It can only be experienced. OK, another, uh, I must move on, or we will never get through everything. Um, an, another uh, characteristic of the mysteries, however, is that uh, they were extraordinarily democratic. Now, we don't normally think of the ancient world as being much of a democratic world, do we? Well, Athens is thought, supposed to be the, the home of democracy, but uh, were there slaves in Athens? Oh, yes, of course there were. The mysteries admitted, initiated anyone who wished to be initiated. It initiated the leading members of society. It initiated slaves. Uh, it made no difference whether you were educated or uneducated. It made no difference whether you were uh, a great athlete uh, or a stumble bum. It made no difference whether you were a man or a woman. Everybody was, was equal uh, in the mysteries. Uh, and that was characteristic of almost all of the mysteries. The only one I know of that that was not characteristic of was the mysteries of Mithra, which was limited to men. And it, it, was, it went primarily through uh, the army. But generally speaking, the ancient mysteries were all open uh, to uh, to any, uh, any person who sincerely desired to enter into them. Um, the mysteries involved always an antithesis between opposites, so that um, uh, there is um, and a surprise uh, as one faces new experiences. So for example, the initiate would be blindfolded uh, and go through the first part of the, of the initiation in the ancient mysteries without seeing, and then have the blindfold removed, have, have the bag pulled off his head. Um, lots of other um, similar cases uh, within the mysteries of a juxtaposition of opposites. And this, of course, has to do with the fact that the mysteries are concerned with death and resurrection, huh? with dying and being reborn, the two greatest opposites uh, in all of life. All right. It is said, then, that the mysteries uh, had something which was told, and that's the myth that lies behind uh, the particular mystery. They had something which was shown, and these are symbolic objects. Uh, there's a great example of this in the Eleusinian mysteries. Uh, one of the later church fathers wanted to make fun of the Eleusinian mysteries uh, because the church fathers were not in favor of them. Uh, and they said, you know what that hierophant, that high priest does in the mysteries when you get to just the top point of it, just the, the acme of it, the, the, the very center uh, of the mysteries, do you know what he does? He holds up a stalk of grain. That's it. Big mystery. The church father was making fun of the mysteries. But why is that a strange thing for him to have done? Well, if any of you are familiar with liturgical Christianity, Roman Catholicism, Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, uh, Episcopalianism. <laughs> you will know that the main church service is the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. And what is the act at the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper 
which occurs at the height of that service. Right? Holds up the host. And what is the host? A bit of bread. Right? Is there any significant difference in that and holding up a stalk of wheat? Both are symbolic acts, right? The bread has been has come, according to um, classical uh, Protestants and Catholics differ on this, but in Catholic theology, the bread has become literally the body, the blood, the soul, the divinity of Christ. Christ is present in the bread, literally. Protestants tend to regard it as symbolic, but in either case, it amounts to very much the same thing. So what do you suppose, why do you suppose that Hierophant was holding up a stalk of grain in the Eleusinian Mysteries, the height of it? The Eleusinian Mysteries were about the goddess Demeter and her daughter Persephone, and Demeter was the goddess of the grain, right? So who was, who was present in that stalk of grain, which the Hierophant held up? Is that essentially different? from the Christian Lord's Supper? I don't think so. But you've got symbolic objects of this kind. And finally, uh, something was done uh, in all of the mysteries, and what was done was the initiation itself. Uh, the initiation in the Eleusinian mysteries lasted several days. Uh, the initiates, the initiates to be, the initiands, uh, walked from Athens to Eleusis. They had ritual baths, they, they fasted, they prepared themselves, then they went into uh, the, uh, the temple at Eleusis, and they watched a mystery play put on, uh, at the height of which the Hierophant held up that stalk of grain. And then afterwards, they had a big feast, kind of celebration at the end of it. Um, practically every one of those elements is present in modern Freemasonry. Hmm? Now, there are things I can't say about Freemasonry, but there are things I can. How, how many of you have ever been inside a Masonic temple which was set up? And, you know, you, you can go, uh, my wife and I have been through the Grand Lodge uh, in, in London. And you can go to Washington and go through uh, the, the Masonic temples there. Uh, they're, they're open for anybody to come in and see. What is the floor like in a properly appointed Masonic temple? All right, it's called a tessellated floor, exactly. And what does that mean? It's a black and white checkerboard. Huh? If you've been in a Masonic temple, you will recall having seen that, right? Sometimes it's a rug, sometimes it's laid out in tiles. That's what tessellated means, tiled. Uh, but it's black and white squares which alternate. What's the point of that? Why is that never in Masonic Temple? It's something which is shown. Huh? What does it mean? What's the significance of it? All of those opposites, right? The black and the white symbolize all of the opposites of life. Uh, pain and pleasure, uh, yin and yang, all of the opposites, whatever they are. Is life an experience of opposites? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, in India, one of the great teachers was Gautama Buddha. And he said that all life is frustration. <laughs> to live is to be frustrated, said the Buddha. And then another great teacher came along shortly after the Buddha and said that all life has at its core an unconditioned and limitless joy. <laughs> who was right? The other teacher was Shankaracharya. Who was right? The Buddha who said all life is frustration or Shankaracharya, who said that all life is limitless joy. They were both right, they were both right of course, because life is 
the checkered floor, right? Black and white. It's both experiences. It's death and resurrection. Right? Now, what the mysteries were about was uh, to bring into realization in the minds of the initiates the fact that life is this mixture of frustration and joy, yin and yang, death and resurrection, and to bring an accommodation to that fact. If, uh, if we simply, um, you know the difference between uh, an optimist and a pessimist? The optimist believes that this is the best of all possible worlds. And the pessimist is afraid that the optimist may be right. <laughs> all right. We don't live only on white squares, and we don't live only on black squares. <laughs> we live on both. Uh, and to live effectively, we have to be able to manipulate on both those, those squares. Uh, and that's what the mysteries were about. And that's what modern Freemasonry is about, uh, emphasizing that point. All right. Um, well, I've been sort of skipping over some things on the mysteries. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Freemasonry then. We don't know when the mysteries got started. But as I said, we know that the mysteries of Eleusis were practiced for well over a millennium, well over a thousand years. Uh, Freemasonry as we know it is comparatively speaking, recent. Uh, my academic field, uh, I've, Betty mentioned I, I'm a retired professor of English, but I didn't do literature much. I did history of the English language. And so I'm a historian, basically. Uh, and historians tend to see things in rather different terms from everybody else. Uh, for a historian, uh, well, we call uh, the language of Shakespeare modern English. That's just yesterday. Um, Freemasonry is just yesterday. It's more recent than Shakespeare. The exact origins of Freemasonry, like the exact origins of the mystery, the ancient mysteries, are unknown. Nobody knows where Freemasonry came from or how it got started. There are guesses about it, guesses of varying uh, probabilities. Uh, now, throughout Freemasonry, there runs a kind of theme, and the theme is indicated by its name, Masonry. <laughs> it is a theme of building. Right? And so um, some people say, well, Freemasonry got started because um, it grew out of the stonemasons who put up the great cathedrals of Europe. And that's the most popular theory for the origin of Freemasonry. And I think it, in fact, is basically right, although I think it's incomplete. Um, there are other theories. One that has become particularly uh, uh, popular recently, about which several books have been published, is that there was a order of chivalry called the Knights Templar who were involved in the Crusades. Um, they eventually stopped doing much fighting and began doing banking instead. Uh, and they became extremely successful bankers. And they accumulated a lot of money. They also had a lot of property because good people gave them property um, as an act of um, charitable giving. So finally, um, the King of France and the Pope in Rome uh, both got concerned about the Knights Templar. The King in France particularly wanted to get his hands on some of that money. Uh, and the Pope was rather concerned because legends had grown up about the Knights Templar. They spent a long time in the Holy Land. They had gotten really quite chummy with the Saracens, the Muslims. And uh, some of them were supposed to be magicians, some of those Saracens. And the Knights Templar got a bad reputation. So the Knights Templar were put out of business, and it was done almost overnight. Their leaders were killed, and the rest of them 
went into hiding, ran away. Uh, now, one of the few countries in Europe which did not actively persecute the Knights Templar uh, was Scotland. And so the theory is that a lot of the Knights Templars went to Scotland where they were safe, and they settled down there, and they continued to practice uh, their Knight Templarism, which was a kind of ritual, and that that became modern Freemasonry. That's a very popular theory now. Uh, I won't express any views on its reality. However, one thing it touches upon that I think is real, there was a very interesting book published just a couple of years ago which argued that modern Freemasonry started in Scotland. And I think there's pretty strong evidence for that. Uh, that what happened was that there were our good old stonemason friends who were building churches, cathedrals, castles, for the nobility and the upper classes. They were a very proud sort because, in fact, a stonemason is uh, an extraordinary craftsman and has to know a lot more than, say, a carpenter does. Why? Well, look at those cathedrals they built. Have some of you been to some of the great cathedrals? in Europe, in England, even some in America. Those cathedrals are marvels. How, do, how does the roof stay up there? How does the, the weight of the roof, how is it supported? It has, there's nothing under it, right? So it has to be supported somehow. How did they do that? They figured out some very, very clever ways of buttressing the walls so they could have a roof very high up, spanning a vast space um, without collapsing. The stonemasons were engineers. Right? And like any engineer, they had to know a lot of mathematics right? in order to put those buildings up and not have them collapse. So they were highly skilled, not only as craftsmen, as workers, but as engineers and as mathematicians. And quite beyond that, um, what, if you go into one of the old cathedrals, what do you see in, inside the cathedrals? Is it just plain stone blocks all around? A lot of carving, isn't there? And the carving shows all sorts of things, so that the stonemasons had also to be very knowledgeable about the legends, Scripture behind the religion. And not just behind the religion, Christianity as we know it, but lots of other things. Um, there is in uh, one of the great cathedrals uh, in, uh, in France um, a wonderful labyrinth in the floor. Have are you familiar with the labyrinths? You may know this, this French labyrinth has become very, very popular. It's been done in a lot of churches in America. Now, we've got one down, down in Wheaton, right? You know, uh, okay, very, very popular. Do you know what was in the center of that labyrinth in the French cathedral originally? It's not there any longer because it was cast in metal. And during one of the, the, the French wars, they took up the metal and melted it down to make cannonballs out of it. But there was a huge medallion in the center of that labyrinth originally. And do you know what the labyrinth, what the, what the, uh, the medallion showed? That, those are good guesses, but no. No, that's a good guess too, but no. It showed a Greek hero by the name of Theseus who was slaying a monster named the Minotaur. And that's where the labyrinth comes from, out of a Greek legend involving Theseus and the Minotaur. Now, the people who built that cathedral knew all about that legend, right? Because in the center of the labyrinth, they put that medallion. You've got eyes and you've got uh, uh, rose, um, roses 
in lots of stained glass windows in the cathedrals. Okay, so uh, the people who built the cathedrals were good craftsmen, they were engineers, they were mathematicians, they were well informed, they were educated, um, well informed people. Right? So they were a class apart from the usual workmen. And that meant they had good relationships with their patrons, the upper classes for whom they were building these castles and cathedrals and, and other buildings. Um, and so they got together. And they began to initiate into their trade unions, guilds, some of the upper class Scotsmen. Because they were buddies. They were brothers. And out of that seems to have arisen um, Freemasonry as we know it, which then spread southward into England. Incidentally, I might add that the, the Grand Lodge of England doesn't like this explanation at all. <laughs> because the real uh, historical records of Freemasonry begin in the year 1717 when four lodges, four Masonic lodges in London, got together and formed a Grand Lodge. And after that, we have some pretty fair records from then on. Before then, almost nothing, only scattered references in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the records of Masonry. All right, now, um, how many women stonemasons were there? None but all that I know of. <laughs> Why not? Well, it's highly skilled work, but it is also, it requires mus muscular, it's muscular work, isn't it? Now, women are strong, but their strength is one of endurance. Women live longer than men. Uh, they can endure things longer and better than men can. Women have greater endurance than men do but men can run faster. In the short haul, a man beats a woman every time. In the long haul, a woman beats a man every time. All right? That's just the fact of life. I don't think it's fair, <laughs> but it's a fact of life. So for activities that require lifting, right? Heavy muscular activity, those are, those are male activities. So the first Freemasons were exclusively men. Why? Well, because stonemasons were exclusively men. <laughs> now, there are a number of legends about women who were initiated into Freemasonry. Um, there's only one case that has anything like substantial evidence for it, and even it is not by any means um, conclusive. Masonry, Freemasonry, was a male domain until the 1890s. In 1882, actually, a French lodge of Freemasons did a very naughty thing. This French lodge of Freemasons, which was called, if I translate the French name into English, the Lodge of Freethinkers, consisted of a lot of men who were in favor of women's rights. They were feminists, and that they were working for votes for women and equal rights for women. So they decided that they would initiate a woman. And they took a very active woman, active in feminist work in France. Her name was Marie de Rem, and they initiated her. And they informed the Grand Orient, which was the head body of their Freemasons in France, what they'd done. And the Grand Orient said, you can't do that. It's not permitted. Uh, it, is, it is not part of Freemasonry that women should be admitted. And they said, we've done it. And uh, the Grand Lodge said, well, then you aren't Freemasons anymore. So they got, in effect, excommunicated. And that lodge dried up and disappeared. But the members in it did not. They got together, and about 11 years later, uh, in 1893, they formed a new lodge 
in which they initiated about a dozen women. And that lodge was the beginning of co-masonry, of masonry that admits both women and men. Now, in the year 1902, this is just nine years after the beginning of French co-masonry. And this was, uh, this, was, this was exclusively French, all right? It had spread to French-speaking Switzerland and Belgium, but it was, it was entirely French. But in 1902, an English woman by the name of Annie Besant got herself, went to Paris and got herself initiated into co-masonry. Now, Annie Besant was a perfectly remarkable person. She became Madame Blavatsky. Um, Betty mentioned Madame Blavatsky as one of the founders of the Theosophical Society, and she was, in a way, the chief idea person behind the society. Annie Besant became uh, Madame Blavatsky's uh, intellectual and spiritual successor. <laughs> Eventually, beca she became international president of the society after Colonel Alcott died in 1907. But in 1902, uh, she went to Paris, got herself initiated into Freemasonry. She had been a really active woman in all sorts of ways. Uh, she had gotten herself elected to the London School Board. Uh, she had gone to the University of London, which was one of the, probably at the time, the only English university which admitted women at all. Uh, she studied chemistry. She never got her degree because the examiner, her examiner, when it came up for her degree examination, said he would never approve a woman. And he, so she never got her degree. She was a brilliant woman. She became the best known woman orator in England during her lifetime. Uh, she was a labor organizer. Uh, she organized the first strike of women workers in England. They were called match girls. And they spent their lives taking little strips of wood and dipping them into noxious chemicals to make matches out of. It was a very dangerous and unhealthy activity. And she organized a strike of them to improve working conditions for the match girls. Um, she also um, got put into jail for selling a book uh, which advocated and explained methods of birth control. <laughs> Um, the book was called The Fruits of Philosophy, and I have a copy of it, <laughs> and I do not recommend it. <laughs> if anyone relied on it, they'd be in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't have much to go on in those days. Okay, so she was a really activist person. Uh, she had been uh, invited into Freemasonry by a friend of hers, um, who was already a member of the French order of co-masons. And she had refused it because she thought masonry, looking at masonry in England, she thought masonry was something that upper class snobs did. And she was all for the rights of the common person. Right? So she had rejected it. But finally she decided there is something in this. So she went, she got initiated in Paris, she came back, and in 1902, she formed in London the first English-speaking Comasonic Lodge in the world. And then she went to India uh, the following year, 1903. And in um, Benares, she and the woman who had gotten her into Comasonry, whose name is Francesca Arendale, and Miss Arendale's nephew, um, George Arendale, the three of them formed what was called a Masonic Triangle in Benares, which was the beginning of a lodge, a Masonic lodge. And that was the first lodge uh, in the English-speaking world. You do understand that India is English-speaking, right? Uh, um, at least the, all of the, all the educated Indians speak English and did then, too. Uh, the first lodge outside England in the English-speaking world um, which admitted women. So that was the beginning of co-masonry. Now, the attitude of co-masons, ah, co-masonry works essentially the same degrees that are worked in masculine masonry. 
craft degrees, Scottish Rite degrees, York Rite degrees. Um, there are, if any of you are masculine masons, uh, you should know that there is not just one Masonic ritual. There are scads of them. They're all basically the same, but they differ in many minor details. Um, but the degrees which co-masonry works would be recognized by any masculine mason as the same degrees he is familiar with, although there are peripheral differences. As a matter of fact, that triangle, which was formed in Benares, was it gave birth to a lodge which was called the Dharma Lodge. And the ritual which was developed in the Dharma Lodge, based on an old English ritual, uh, is a ritual that almost all, well, that all English speaking Comasonic lodges in the world today still use. And it's called the Dharma Ritual, because that's where it started in 1903. Um, now, masculine masons regard masculinity as a landmark of masonry. The landmarks are aspects of masonry which cannot be changed. Right? If you change them, you don't have masonry anymore. You've got something else. Right? They are the essentials. They are the defining elements of masonry. Masculine masons have traditionally regarded masculinity as a landmark of masonry. It is the argument of it is the position of co-masons that that's incorrect. That Freemasonry developed with only men because it developed out of the stonemason's craft. And there were only men who were stonemasons. So it was an accident, not, uh, not a landmark, a social historical accident. All right, now, I've talked a little bit about the ancient mysteries. I've talked a little bit about modern Freemasonry. Do you see some parallels between the things I have talked about? I don't have to point them out. I've, been, I've tried to describe them so that the parallelism would be, would be obvious. Let me say just a quick word about what I think is the cause of those parallelisms. All human beings are basically alike. Uh, we may think that other human beings are very different from us, but basically we are all remarkably similar. Right? Among species, we are perhaps the most unified species on this planet. Our differences are superficial. And that applies not just to our physical makeup, it applies, it applies to our psychic, intellectual, spiritual makeup as well. This fact was discovered or put forth as an explanation by a Swiss psychologist by the name of Carl Jung that I'm sure many of you are, whose name I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Carl Jung discovered in treating his patients, uh, he, he had them do dream analysis the way he was a student of Freud's originally. So he had them do dream analysis. But also he had them do sketches, do artwork. You didn't have to be an artist, but just doodles, right? And then he would analyze, get them to analyze their doodles. And what he discovered was that they were doing doodles which had designs which were extremely close to certain designs in second and third century alchemical manuscripts. And these people had no knowledge whatever of those manuscripts or of alchemy. How do you explain this? Well, Jung came up with an explanation which he called the collective unconscious, that all human beings share a common unconscious mind. Each of us has our own personal unconscious, right? 
I've got mine, you've got yours. It contains all of those things that happen to us that we um, have forgotten about, sometimes quite deliberately forgotten about, that we don't like, <laughs> we're pressed, uh, we don't want to remember. But in addition to that personal unconscious, which is what Freudian psychologists work with, Jung says we all share a collective unconscious, which has been evolved with the species over the millennia. And that unconscious mind is extraordinarily powerful because it motivates things we do without our knowing that we're being so motivated. The strongest possible motivation is one you're not aware of because you just assume it's in the nature of things. That's the way it has to be. I believe that our unconscious minds, our unconscious collective minds, have in them a desire for transcendence. Human beings are not satisfied with being themselves. <laughs> we look at ourselves and we see ourselves as the Buddha saw us. Unsatisfactory. Frustrated and frustrating. Right? All human beings want to be something better than they are. Whether or not they admit it, this is an unconscious motivation. Right? They want to self-transcend. And that's what the ancient mysteries were about. And that's what modern Freemasonry is about. Um, oh, I know that many people, when they think of Freemasonry, think of what? Secrecy. Secrecy. But, you know, we've talked about that and why that, that's almost inevitable. But what, 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 what's the public face of Masonry? Shriner. The Shriners, right? Guys with cute little fez, fez hats who blow whistles and ride motorcycles and do good work like sponsoring hospitals for sick children. Uh, masonry is, for many people, a social activity with good charitable purposes. It's sort of like... Um, the Rotarians with a ritual. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. That is masonry. Because masonry emphasizes the importance of brotherhood, right? of interacting with one's fellow masons uh, on a level fashion <laughs> and being on the square with them, with all human beings, but particularly, of course, with one's brother masons. It emphasizes brotherhood and the importance of brotherhood. That's good. That's fine. But I would suggest that beneath that, there is this other urge for transcendence. And the Masonic ritual is about transcendence. It's about death and resurrection. It's about leaving the old and entering the new. It is about forsaking the darkness and finding the light. If any of you are Masons, you, you, you will recognize what I've been talking about is being straight out of Masonic practice. Right? So modern Freemasonry, whether or not we actually know it, is in fact a spiritual path. Because it's a path which offers us a way to transcendence, to personal transcendence. Um, I'll tell you a little, I'll, I'll end by telling you a little personal story about myself. Um, as Betty mentioned, I came into co-masonry. I've never been a masculine mason. I came straight into co-masonry. I came into it in, in England. And I was initiated in a lodge in England which was a lodge that worked the ritual better 
than any other lodge I have ever seen in my life. They were simply superb. They had it down, right? Uh, it was uh, a perfect performance. I was entered in that lodge. I went to the second degree in that lodge. Actually, we had come home. I had to go back to England to get the second degree. When it came time for me to get the third degree, and the third degree is the one which gives you your full Masonic stature. You aren't really fully a Mason and you get the third degree. Uh, I don't know how it is in, in some of your experiences who are, are Masons. Uh, Co-Masons don't do the degrees all at once, ever. Uh, they, they, they're separated. Well, in my case, it was separated by a couple of years uh, because we think there are lessons to be learned in each of the degrees. All right. I took the first and second degrees in England in a lodge which worked it absolutely beautifully. I took the third degree in a lodge in this country, which I will leave nameless, which is, was then probably the worst ritual lodge I have ever seen in my life. People couldn't remember their lines. They couldn't even read them aloud if they had them written down. <laughs> They forgot where they were in the ceremony. Uh, I was brought in at one point, and they remembered that they hadn't done something right, so I had to be set out. So they had to do it before they bring me back in again. I, it was a mess. Now, when I was initiated in England in this beautiful lodge, I said to myself, what have I got myself into my wife went away and left me, and what have I done? I've joined up with a bunch of adults who are behaving like little boys. These are men and women both, right? They're behaving like little boys in a club where you get sworn to secrecy. Uh, this is the silliest thing I've ever seen in my life. But I had agreed I would persevere through the third degree, through take all three degrees. So I'm a man of my promise. So I persevered. The second degree wasn't any better, done in that beautifully, ritually experienced lodge in, in London. Um, the third degree, done sloppily, disgracefully. At the end of the third degree, I suddenly realized what masonry was. And I was, from that point on, I was a Mason. <laughs> Not just because I had been put through some ceremony, but because for me, at that point, something clicked. And I realized what Masonry was about. It was not just keeping little secrets away from other people. It was not just um, having a nice banquet after the meeting was over. <laughs> and the only reason for the meeting was to have the banquet at the end. It was not just uh, making contacts uh, of a business nature. Uh, it was not just raising money for charity. Right? Masonry is about a kind of personal transformation. It doesn't always happen. But when it does, it is incommunicable. <laughs> I can't tell you what it was. I can only talk about it in general terms. So I thank you all very much for letting me uh, talk about this mysterious and very secret subject this evening. Thank you, John, for talking about something you can't tell us about. <laughs> I do that all the time. <laughs> Um, do, would you like to answer a few questions? I'd be pleased you? to hear some. Yes. I'd be entertained to hear some questions. Yeah. He will entertain some questions. Yeah. Does anybody have a question? Yes, Martin. Since you said you weren't, they weren't exactly sure where masonry originated before 1717, is there a viable theory of people who believe perhaps that it did keep going somehow underground from the 4th century through to the 1700s? Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't mention that, but in fact, yes, that has also been uh, suggested, that the ancient mysteries, although they were officially terminated, uh, this was after uh, Constantine became Holy Roman Emperor and 
uh, converted to Christianity and well even after him there was an attempt to reintroduce some of the old uh, pagan practices but was not successful. Um, after that the mysteries as formal activities that people knew about ended and it's usually supposed that they disappeared altogether. But in fact, there is some reason to think that in parts of Eastern Europe and in parts of Northern Spain and Southern France, uh, they may have been carried on. Right? And there may be then yeah, the Albigensians, uh, for example, and the Bogavils. Uh, that, that the old mystery practices may have not in quite the formal structured way they were. Obviously, the, 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 the mysteries of Eleusis were lost because nothing happened in Eleusis anymore. But the others may have survived and may, in fact, uh, have come along and contributed eventually uh, to the formation of, um, of modern Freemasonry. That really gets us into, in a sense, that gets us into the Knights Templar theory because they, are, they, are, they have been linked with, with those, those surviving groups as well. The problem here is that there is not strong historical evidence. There's not documentary evidence for it. It's all um, implicational. <laughs> but it may be. Yeah. Is there a legendary among the Northlands? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, ma masonry is. Um, we tend to think of it as Christian because we are, as a whole, basically a Christian nation. Our culture is Christian. Um, but masonry is not by any means exclusively Christian. Uh, that's something I didn't mention, uh, but one of the landmarks of masonry is that you must believe in a supreme intelligence in the universe. That's what we call God. Right? doesn't mean you have to have any particular concept of what God is like. Right? You don't have to think of him as a man with a long white beard on a throne. Right? You don't have to think of him as a trinity. Right? But if you're a Mason, if you're a Mason who observes the landmarks of Masonry, you must believe that in the universe there is a guiding intelligence which orders things. Right? It could be. I mean, masonry doesn't say. Masonry ha is not a set of doctrines, right? Masonry does not has no information, has no teachings as such. Masonry, there's an old question: uh, What is Freemasonry? Uh, any of you who are Masons will, will know this. It's part of the uh, the Catechism of the First Degree, uh, and it's been published many times. And uh, I was never sworn to secrecy about it. So the answer to the question: What is Freemasonry? Is it is a peculiar system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. A peculiar system of morality, veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. Now, uh, you have to understand, Masonic language is inherently archaic. Okay? It's basically 18th century language. So words don't always mean what you think they mean. Peculiar doesn't mean funny, strange, odd. <laughs> peculiar means particular, special. So it's a special or particular system of morality. And morality doesn't mean just thou shalt and thou shalt not. Uh, morality here comes from the Latin word mos, which means way of acting, way of behaving, custom. So it's a particular way of living. That's what that definition actually means. Failed in allegory and illustrated by symbols. Masonry is basically symbolic. So it doesn't get into the questions of what that divine intelligence is like. And any Mason is free to think of it in any way he or she likes, right? As long as you say, yep, it's there, right? Somewhere, somehow. Um, masonry is undogmatic in that respect. Um, now, have I, did, did I lose your question altogether in my answer, <laughs> which sometimes happens? Big point? Okay. Oh, Muslims. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so there, of course, uh, there, there, are, there are 
there are Muslims who are Masons. Uh, there are lots of Hindus who are Masons. Uh, there are Buddhists who are Masons. Because uh, Buddhists don't believe in, in, a, in a personal God at all. Uh, they, they don't believe in, in, in a theistic God at all. But they believe that the universe is pervaded by something they call the Buddha nature. And the Buddha nature is conscious and wise. And it's in everything. So it's kind of pantheistic in that sense. And that's fine. <laughs>